Let us pray. Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. We know there's a miracle here in the scripture, but, but I think the largest miracle here is not that people spoke in different languages. I think the largest miracle here is that people listened. I think there's a large miracle whenever we listen to each other and we understand one and each other. I, I think that is a huge thing that is underestimated. Just because it's in our language does not mean that we understand. It does not mean that we hear. It does not mean that we come to the same place. This story is about the healing of the brokenness that took place during the Tower of Babel. Uh, if you remember the Old Testament story, and we get the word uh, whenever somebody speaks gibberish, whenever we hear somebody going on and on, they're just, they're just babbling. This is, yeah, it's amazing how much of our, our world comes from Scripture. They're just babbling. Well, they decided that they could build a tower that reached all the way to heaven. I would suggest that there might be some arrogance little arrogance in that and then it says God confused their language I would suggest that God didn't have to do a whole lot of confusing whenever people get filled with arrogance whenever we become filled with arrogance it doesn't break our language it breaks our hearing whenever we get filled with arrogance we quit listening because we already know everything I'm going to throw some teenagers under the bus. Any of y'all ever had a teenager in your house? Could you tell them anything? Why? I already know everything. Could I get an amen? Amen. I think God does that so we won't miss them so much. You know, you love them dearly, but sometimes it's like, son, it's time for you to go. There's the door. It just feels that way. I'm just, it has nothing to do with today's sermon. But there is an incredible miracle here that people listen and they hear and they understand one another. One of the things that's required whenever we do uh, weddings, and it's part of our covenant as Methodist preachers, is that we do premarital counseling. And one of the parts that I like to do, or I think is most important, is teaching people to communicate and to listen and to understand one and each other. I know my wife says I need to go back for some remedial training. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that wasn't my wife. I know her voice. <laughs> but it's not wrong. So I had a couple sitting in my office, and they were really sweet, and they were young, and they were in love, and they didn't hear a word the other said. I mean, you want to talk about rose-colored glasses. I'm like, man, can you see anything through those? So I sent them home with some homework so that they could learn more about communicating with each other and learn to begin to hear each other. Well, they came back the next week, God bless their little hearts, which means I now can say anything. Isn't that Southern speak for you're about to hear something? And they, they sit across from me and they go, you know what? We found out during our homework that we never heard each other at all. I go, yeah, I know. Why you got that homework? And it was so cute. They then said, well, will you still marry us? <laughs> well, before I answer that, can I ask you one question? Now that you can hear each other, do you still want to get married? <laughs> There's something funny about that. Now that you actually understand each other, do you still want to get married? Well, yeah. I go, okay. Well, then let's move on through this. But that's, how did they not know? Do y'all ever have that question? How did they not know that they couldn't hear each other? I think we live in that place right now in this world. We live in a world 
where there's no listening. We live in a world where there's only shouting. You know, one of the things that's funny, if you've ever traveled to a foreign country and you try to speak to somebody in English and they aren't getting it, what's the next thing we do? We talk louder and slower, like that's going to fix it. What are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to get louder and maybe then they'll get it. That's the world we live in right now. We, we, we have sides that are not communicating, they're not listening because, and I think this is because at the base of it, we have assumptions and, and we have presumptions. And, and underlying it all is we each have our own ethics. And I would like to suggest to you, I've never met, well, I need to back up a little bit. I've met, met very few people who have no ethics. Now, having done prison ministry, I've run into them. You ask them, why did you steal it? Because I wanted it. Well, it's theirs, but I wanted it. They had no basis for any kind of ethic like there's some injustice that took place. It's just I wanted it and they had it. Now, if you ever teach two-year-olds, you will run into this ethic. But sometime after that, we tend to grow out of that. And what I, what I found out of many, many people is there's an ethic, but it's just not the same ethic that I have. It may be just a different ethic. While I was working at GE Capital, we had a particular uh, man that I worked with who was incredible at getting in. An, he's had an incredible amount of work ethic. He got a lot of work done. He booked a whole lot of business. He was really good at what he did. And he partied like it was 1999. <laughs> December 31st. <laughs> All the time. He, uh, it, was, it was really kind of interesting. I was like, do you have any ethic? And you know what I came to find out? He said, yeah, I believe in the work ethic. Now, he would come to work hungover. He would go to lunch and drink. He would come back. Guess what happens if you drink at lunch? Yeah. A lot. He was sober sometimes. And he worked incredibly hard. And you know what was funny was, whenever I would talk to him, when it, he would discount other people who didn't work as hard as he did. He had a singular ethic, and it was an ethic of getting it done, which explained why he came in hungover. He showed up, and he got it done. And it was really kind of an interesting person, a very likable guy, very charming. But did he have an ethic? Yeah. Just not the same one that I have. Now, it also spilled out and it created disaster in his family and with his children and with his wife. And, and he wasn't all that healthy. But he had an ethic. And, and I find within life, we all have some underlying thing that we hold is the highest ethic. But there might be a slightly higher ethic than that. One of, one of the things that's dividing the church right now is that there's two underlying ethics. One, one ethic of holiness and, and another ethic of justice. Now within God, I find both. There is both holiness and justice. One side is holding up their hand and talking about the need for social justice. And the other side talking about, well, there is a need for deep personal holiness. Well, which is it? The answer is yes. The, the answer is to both. And, and the reason I think that we have such a divide at this time is that we're talking by each other and we're not listening to the ethic that is grounded in both. Which brings me to the subject of worship. Because here's one of the things that I think should happen and is the highest purpose of worship is that when we come into the presence of God, we come into the presence of the highest ethic that there is. That within God's character and who God is, God has the highest ethic. 
And God's ethics should orient and prioritize our ethics. And so to come and to be exposed into the highest being that is with the highest ethics then should reorient our lives if we're listening. If we come into the presence of God. The idea of sin is this, that we have missed the mark. Well, what is that mark? That mark is the ethic of who God is, the underlying person who God is. Now, I would suggest that we have gone through life and we've picked up parts of kind of our favorite parts of the ethic and we try to live that out while we don't live out the other, while we look at somebody else and try to blame them so that we don't feel so bad about the part we don't get right. Y'all are really quiet. Did that make any sense? Y'all, some of y'all are being so still. You're, you're. I'm, I'm just going to subject that you think, well, you're not talking about me. <laughs> no, I'm talking about me. You see what, what 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 worship does is it brings us into the presence of God so that we can see what is the higher ethic that we should live to, and that we should then reorient our life around that. Which is it? Justice. Or holiness. The two are together. You can't separate them. They're part of each other. Which leads me to kind of a story to talk about all that this morning. So as you know, we just went to annual conference. And annual conference uh, promised this year to be somewhat divisive. If you may not have watched any news, unless you're completely devoid of what all is going on, there is a discussion of whether the United Methodist Church should split. As one professor said, whenever he was talking about us being United Methodist, he said, we're neither. Ouch. And so as we go to conference, I would suggest that the, the political split that lies within the United States or North America lies within our church, lies within our subculture and, and, and everything else that we live. So we, we came together with the high expectations that it might not be really pretty. In fact, it might get ugly, and we were somewhat worried about that. But I would like to report that something miraculous happened. It was not. It was wonderful worship. It was people coming together. It was people coming to love the Lord together. And one of the really interesting things that happened is we had five proposals put on the table for us to look at and pass. There were five of them. Uh, two passed, two failed, and one withdrew from the battle of the, the field of battle. The person just stood up and go, mm, nope, we're not going to do this which I have to give them high props for. Two passed, two failed, and one wandered off. Now what was amazing about the two that passed is they passed by a super majority. I, I would suggest that as I looked around, it was over 90% of the people voted for them. Now, what in the world could we agree on in a 90% level? Um, how, did we, how did we do that? There were a couple people who were like, I can't believe we came to an agreement on that much of anything. And I go, it is interesting. Uh, one of the, the two proposals was I helped and I was on the team that put that together. And what was interesting about the team that did that was that it was not of a singular group and it was not of a singular mindset. It was across the aisles and across a whole group of people. And as we put it together, when we wrote the language, we had one centering idea around it. And the question we kept asking is, is this fair? Is it equitable? You see, we, we rose up uh, above into a higher standard from a higher standard of who's the winners and who's the losers, but the higher standard of can we ask the question, what is fair? for everybody who is here. And then people stood behind it together. And when people saw people standing together, who usually don't, a lot of people voted for it. 
The, the second one was a bit controversial and it came forward and there were amendments that went back and forth. There was posturing, there was parliamentary procedure. Um, it's amazing how good we get at that stuff. At some point you just kind of roll your eyes and say, please, Lord, please. Well, we, we withdrew for the night because it became five o'clock and as good Methodists, we may need to vote, but we're going to eat. If I'm lying, I'm dying. I'm telling you. We all looked at our watch and go, yeah, we need to go. Five o'clock, we need to go get a meal. Um, and that night was also worship for ordination, where we drew together and we ordained new pastors. I tell you what, if you need to go to some worship, go to some worship for ordination. That will renew your faith. So anyway, we withdrew for the night. And the two sides reached across the aisle from each other that night and met all evening and sat down and worked out their differences. And I would suggest, while I wasn't in the meeting, that they probably started by listening. They probably started by hearing one another. And what I understand their guiding principle underneath this was, how is it that we can do this so that there is consistency across the church. How is it that we can be fair and consistent and bring this to the whole church? And the next morning, we had a whole new amendment rewritten with some new sections in it. And I'm like, oh, good. This will be even more fun. To which then they stood up and said, we reached across the aisles to each other and we stand together and ask that you vote for this. And then a lot of people voted together. What I noticed about these two things was what? That there was a higher ethic involved that draws people together. Why do we worship? Because God is a higher ethic. And the only chance we have of coming together is under the ethic that God has. My prayer is may we wake up and hear what God has for us. And may we live into that so that we may really take communion together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.